I value education. I've worked in Christian higher ed. I believe in Christian education. I am not here to tank all Christian education. In fact, this is my love letter to Christian higher ed to beg with them and plead with them Mm. to please keep the faith Mm. and to have some moral courage. Please stand up for the faith. Please do not cave to the critical social theories in the name of being academically respected. This is not your typical video on how to choose a seminary or a college if you are a Christian. I had my friend Krista Bontrager come on today and talk about a topic that I've never covered before, but it is something that she is quite passionate about and she is a wealth of information and this conversation is very interesting. I've never actually explored this topic, so I didn't realize that there's a lot of nuance with what Christians are facing, especially Christian parents, Uh, in what they have to deal with when they send their kids off to college or to seminary. And there's a lot to this. If you don't know who Krista is, she specializes in a variety of topics uh, from theology to apologetics, uh, cultural topics especially. And one of the main topics that she talks about is critical race theory or critical theory in general. I had her ministry partner and my good friend Monique Dusan on not too long ago to talk about critical race theory. If you don't know what critical race theory is or critical theory, I promise you, you have seen it. This video is not about critical theory or critical race theory specifically because the assumption is is that maybe you've heard of it before and you have seen it, especially in colleges, uh, in, in workplaces, DEI training, things like that. If you don't know what that is, I highly recommend Uh, looking in the description for material there that will help you have a foundation for what critical theory is so that you can kind of better understand the issues that we're going to talk about in this video. Krista covers a variety of topics that a lot of you might be wondering about. How do you choose a good seminary? What are the deal breakers? What to look out for? What should I do to help prepare myself and my child for challenges that they might face when it comes to these things being taught in the classroom? She talks about the guilt that maybe some parents might feel if they have sent their kids off to college and they end up deconstructing later. Our goal is to help equip and encourage you. And also, this isn't just for parents. Uh, This is also for, for Christians in general who want to go to seminary. And, and find a good place that they can have a good biblical foundation in. And I hope that you enjoy this interview. I'm excited to be here and to talk with you about this very important topic. Krista, tell my audience about who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, I'm a theologian. I've been working in theology and apologetics for about 30 years now. And yes, I am that old. Uh, I went to seminary in the early and mid 90s at Talbot School of Theology. I have a Master of Arts in Theology and another Master of Arts in Bible Exposition. And I had hoped to be on a trajectory to be a wonderful intellectual. And thankfully, the week before I sent in all my non-refundable deposits to go back east and sell all of our worldly possessions and start a doctoral program, the Lord knew better. And he, uh, we found out that we were pregnant with our first child. And uh, that was the end of my academic trajectory but the Lord had a better plan in mind. So I am the mother of two children, ages 25 and uh, 21 now. My husband and I have been married for 32 years, and I have worked a lot in the realm of science apologetics. I did that for over two decades. As we were raising our kids, I had the wonderful opportunity of working part-time in apologetics so I could still homeschool my kids And now my kids are grown. And as that process happened, I kind of accidentally ended up co-founding the Center for Biblical Unity in 2020 with my best friend, Monique Mm Dusan. And now we run that full time together. So Mm -hmm. that's a little bit of what I'm up to. My website is theologymom.com and you can find my YouTube channel, my Facebook page and connect with me there. Yeah. And so when I say that Krista is literally one of the smartest women I know, I mean that. You guys should really check out her stuff. Also, two very uh, amazing things, in my opinion, that you left out is number one, you and Monique are writing a book 
Um, what's the name of your book? Yes, it's called Walking in Unity, and mm-hmm. it's available on presale right now wherever books are sold. You can get it at christianbook.com or Books a Million, Amazon. And it's a little bit about our story mm-hmm. of a very unlikely friendship of two people from two different cultures, two different ethnicities, two different socioeconomic places of growing up in Southern California. But we were both, we both went to Biola as undergrads, but we are in different generations. And so uh, the book is a little bit about the story of our unlikely friendship. And along the way, as we kind of embarrass ourselves with all of the mistakes that we made in having those inter- ethnic conversations, intercultural conversations with each other, we share biblical principles for a better framework for thinking about ethnic unity Mm -hmm. as an alternative to what the world is offering. Yeah. And I have the great honor of reading and endorsing this book. So be sure to check it out. And also number two, you're getting your doctorate, right? You're you're, uh, in standpoint theology. (laughs) Well, you have it almost correct. It is it is a little confusing. Yeah. I'm working on a doctor of ministry at Birmingham Theological Seminary. And my dissertation is on standpoint theory, okay. sometimes called standpoint epistemology. Okay. And I'm really just doing a deep dive into a lot of feminist and Marxist literature, mm. asking the question of Is standpoint theory coming into our churches, Mm -hmm. particularly evangelical churches, and changing how we interpret the Bible? And not in a good way, (laughs) but this is the thesis that I am trying to investigate. Yeah, maybe it would be interesting to kind of dig that out because I'm sure 90% of the people are like, what's standpoint? Are you standing on a point? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. And even, me, even for me, I've heard of that before, but only in like, you know, critical theory books or yeah. um, I think the first time I ever heard it was I think Elisa, Elisa Childers, she mentions, I'm like, what is, what is this? What is this word that keeps coming up? So yeah, yeah it's that, just a very short version yeah. that I gave to my gave to my mother to try to explain to her what I was doing is if you've ever heard the saying, you know, um, about reading through the Bible through a black lens, or I'm trying to find like, you know, what is the black perspective Mm -hmm. on this issue or black theology Mm -hmm. or um, that kind of language is uh, you have to kind of decode the language and what's underneath that is a whole framework that is adjacent to critical theory mm-hmm. and part of critical theory, it but it's called like standpoint it. epistemology. Okay. And it came out of the 1970s out of feminist theory is where it originates. Okay. And it's real. It, it kind of got on my radar because two years ago at the Southern Baptist convention, there was a messenger who stood up and ask a question about this issue of, is there a right way to interpret the Bible? Like that there's an author centered meaning that we are all trying to look for, or is there a white way of interpreting the Bible? That's standpoint theory. And when I heard that messenger ask that question, like little yellow flags went off in my mind. And I thought that is a very provocative question and uh, just kind of stuck with me and eventually led me into a doctoral program. Yeah, I'm, I would be so interested. Maybe we can get you back on after. Because yeah. to me, I'm like, it's like a Middle Eastern perspective. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, you're kind we're of talking you about it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, why, why is it this or this? Very yeah. interesting that that was his perspective where yeah. it, it's assumed that it's just like a white perspective where, I don't know, to this, you and me, that sounds strange. This is a growing idea though, Mm -hmm. even among evangelicals, that there is a white way or a black way or a Latino way of interpreting the Bible. And the idea of looking for an author-centered, objective approach to interpreting the scriptures is impossible. I highly disagree with that. (laughs) It's so interesting. So that's that's what I'm investigating. Great. I'm so glad you're doing that. Um, Yeah. So let's, I'll keep a lookout for that. I'll keep my viewers updated, but yeah. So we, you mentioned a lot of seminaries just in that introduction, 
And this is what we have you on to talk with you about today, because uh, I think this is an untouched topic. You and I have talked about this a little bit off camera. Um, and this is a topic that you are very interested in is, is seminaries, colleges. Uh, how do parents and even college age Christians navigate this environment and atmosphere today where they can't find a university, a college, or sadly, even a seminary sometimes that has not been touched by today's political and cultural climate. Why don't you tell me a little bit about this and what are some of the uh, issues that you find that people run into in this regard? Yeah, and I'll try to keep this brief. It kind of started for me back in 2020. Mm -hmm. My older, my oldest daughter was attending Biola University at that time, and we are a three generation Biola family. My husband and I met there, and both graduated from there. My husband's parents both went to Biola, and it was our dream to have both of our children go to Biola. Mm -hmm. And we started saving for their education when they were born. And that's how committed and serious we were to sending our kids to a private, very expensive Christian higher ed situation because we had had such a positive experience at Biola and it was a wonderful launching point for our lives. And we wanted our kids to have that same thing. Mm -hmm. And so we started saving diligently a few hundred dollars every month and invested that and that money grew to the point where it was really going to help us fund their education. And so our first daughter went there and then suddenly the pandemic happened. And on March 17th of 2020, she came home and, you know, your kids away at college, you kind of know generally what's happening with them, like what dorm they're living in and, you know, that they're probably making late night in and out runs and, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, but you don't know all of the ins and outs of what's happening with them. And when she came home, I think that some things happened where I started noticing, wait a minute, like what's, what's going on here? What messaging is Biola sending my kid? I wasn't watching Biola chapels online. I was living my life. I was working and we had a daughter still at home in high school. And so I wasn't watching the social media feeds of my daughter's professors. I wasn't doing, I was just trusting they have a good statement of faith. Their president has assured us that they're being maintaining biblical fidelity and that, and to the strong, um, they're making a strong institutional stand for the historic Christian faith. I believed all of that. Mm -hmm. And what I started recognizing was that there was a whole lot of pieces of data that I wasn't, I was not looking at mm -hmm. and noticed um, that I needed to start asking different questions and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here because it involves my daughter and she deserves her privacy. She hasn't decided to be a public figure the way that I have. So I'm not going to give a ton of specifics about mm -hmm. her experience, but um, I will say like what I learned along the way. And so what I did was I started calling people that I knew who still worked there from when I was there. Mm -hmm. And I started calling old professors and reaching out to them and saying, what is, what is happening? What is this messaging that my daughter's getting in chapel and in her classes and, and all of this, this is troubling. And in the beginning, I honestly thought, well, this is just some rogue prof. Th this isn't a big problem. This is one, maybe two rogue profs that are just out of step with the doctrinal statement. And the more people I interviewed, and it really started to snowball where I interviewed multiple deans and multiple department chairs and faculty members and parents of current Biola students and parents of former Biola students and staff people. And I probably inter interviewed one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom privately over 25 people mm -hmm. who were at Biola in one capacity or another. And what I started to notice was, oh, this is an institutional issue. This is not just one or two 
rogue profs. And that started causing me to ask other questions about what's going on in Christian higher ed more broadly. Mm. You know, is, is this just at Biola or is this other places? And so I started then doing a deep dive on watching chapels. I probably watched over 50 chapels on the Biola YouTube channel. I started reading what are called academic resumes or curricula vitae for various professors. And what I started noticing is that, and and then I started expanding my search to other Christian higher ed institutions. Here's what I noticed. Some of the patterns is that um, a lot of people who work in Christian higher ed, a good percentage of them have doctorates, PhDs, in particular, PsyDs, they have degrees from secular institutions. And then what happens is that those people are brought into faculty at Christian Christian colleges. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with having a, a degree from a secular institution. I have two of them. Yeah. Yeah. And so that isn't immediately troubling to me. But it did raise some questions in my mind of, well, I wonder how well colleges vet people when they're hiring these faculty about worldview issues. Hmm. And what do, have they given thought to, oh, here's what my academic discipline has taught me how to think. And then how does that interface with the Christian worldview? Where does it agree and disagree? with the Christian worldview. And what made me start thinking about that was um, somebody that I interviewed who was actually on the hiring team at his Christian university. And so he was the one who was in the room with a lot of potential faculty members. And this was at a very large top five Christian university. And he said, you would be shocked as to how little vetting happens in that room on integration issues. He said, we will ask people for their personal testimony. We might see on their application where they go to church, but very few of them can articulate issues of integration between their academic discipline and their worldview and where it agrees and disagrees. Hmm. And I thought, that's very interesting. And so then I started investigating that more. And when you see in the curriculum vitae's or academic curricula or academic resumes of a lot of faculty members, you can see what papers they've published in peer-reviewed journals. And what I started noticing was how many Christian faculty, you know, the way that they were getting tenure and the way that they were being brought in is they were publishing things about critical theory. Hmm. And there was not a lot of integration happening of, hey, here's what critical theory is saying in my discipline, whether that's in English literature or law or sociology or social work or psychology or education. You know, here's where it agrees and where it disagrees with my worldview. It seemed like these papers were very affirming of aspects of critical theory. And so I just continued to ask more and more questions of who's teaching at these institutions? Who's, who's really out there that is being recruited. Now that's not to say that there are not faithful men like Thaddeus Williams or Mm -hmm. Dr. JP Moreland, you know, that these are people who are slugging it out in Christian higher ed and are maintaining the distinctives of the Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. I'm old enough that I was there when J.P. Moreland came to Biola to start the apologetics program. And first he started the MA in um, philosophy and and religion. Mm -hmm. And his goal was to create world-class scholars through that program, that Master of Arts program, who could go on to secular institutions and get PhDs and defend the faith. Mm -hmm. But he was so intentional about 
training mostly men at that time. I think there were one or two women in the program at the beginning, but mostly those guys on how to defend the faith, how to think in a distinctly Christian way before they go on to secular institutions to do their PhD work. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get a sense that that was what was happening in a lot of other cases. Hmm. And so it was more research, more digging, more looking and reading and, um, I started to realize that the world of Christian higher ed was not what I thought it was. Hmm. And in the, in many cases, what was being taught specifically in, specifically in some majors like education, sociology, social work, um, psychology, and English literature, those are probably like the big five areas. The critical theory was very alive and well in most of our Christian higher ed institutions. Mm. And that students were not being taught how to respond to critical theory or how to maybe push back against it or to see where it contradicted the Christian worldview. They were being taught from the standpoint of, or the assumption that critical theory is true, basically, essentially, mostly true, and then proceeding from there. And then working out their education based on those principles. And that seemed to be more of the norm than how I had been, you know, educated 30 years ago, where we had a very distinctive Christian approach to different disciplines. So that's kind of a little bit of my journey of how I got interested in this. And then just seeing a lot of Christian parents online on social media asking, where can I send my kid? What's a, you know, especially in 2020, 2021, people are like, what's a safe school to send my child to for their Christian education? And so started getting a lot of those letters and really having to think that through. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that it reminds me of uh, some churches that have that same issue where um, you're, you're, you want people to come to church, but the, the bar is low sometimes on, on who you hire to do a job to excellence. Right. Um, and so you, you end up having like a mixture where you're sparring it within some churches where one side is, super biblical, um, really wanting to, to, to do that. Right. They, they don't really want to, they want to please God more than anything. And the other side is more wanting to kind of mix it with the culture and they kind of, they spar a little bit. And I've noticed that. Um, and that seems to be happening within some seminaries. Now you mentioned, uh, a few of, of these, these seminaries, how how can you tell what what can you tell Christian parents about where they can send their their child? What do you think are some good seminaries that you can advise uh, parents to send their their kids to? Yeah, so let's talk about Christian undergraduate programs, and then we can talk about seminaries because those are kind of a little bit of of two different two different. Um, issues. So here's the operational assumption that Christian parents need to have. Mm. And I know this is going to be hard for some of your listeners to believe, but you will save yourself a lot of time (laughs) and the hundreds of hours of research that I went through. If you could just come to this very basic operating assumption, and that is that the school that you are looking at, and I'm only talking about Christian universities. I'm I'm not talking about secular universities. At secular universities, you just have to assume critical theory is already there. It's in place. It's institutional and go from there. But the operational assumption when it comes to a Christian undergraduate college program, here's what you must assume, that the school already employs staff staff members, faculty members, who have implemented policies and procedures 
based on the critical social theories. You have to assume that it's already there, at least at the staff member level, that there are some percentage of the staff, even at historically conservative, Bible-believing colleges that came out of the great Bible college movement from 100 to 150 years ago, okay? I know this is going to shock people, but you, you must understand that operationally there are staff who already work there who are sympathetic to the critical social theories. Your task as the parent is to try to figure out and detect how widespread it is. Is it just a few faculty members or is it at the department level or is it at the institutional level? And so you will save yourself so much headache and confusion if you just have the operating assumption that they already, the school already employs some staff. It might be five people. It might not be a big number, but there are people there who are, who are sympathetic to the critical social theories. Almost no Christian colleges are screening this out at the staff member level that I can tell. Now, there are a few colleges, I think, that are trying to turn it around. This might be less true at a Bible college, but I'm talking about like a full-fledged undergraduate, you know, university level type of education. So the first thing that you need to do is to read carefully the school's statement of faith. And I'm going to give you a couple of things to look for. Look for how specific it is. Is it five lines or is it a page? (laughs) Like when you see on a Christian college website and you have a hard time even finding their statement of faith, that's a red flag. If their statement of faith is fairly brief, that's a yellow flag. Okay. If their statement of faith is fairly robust and specific, that's a good sign that good things um, might be happening there. Um, Look for whether the school has an official public stance on traditional marriage. Hmm. If they have the courage to have an official public stance on marriage, that's a good sign. Second thing to look for is if they have a public statement on inerrancy of the Bible, not just inspirational, not just saying we believe the Bible is inspired, but do they believe that the Bible is the error free word of God Mm -hmm. and they have it publicly posted on their website? Those are some good signs that good things could be happening. And then I would move along to kind of the the next phase of vetting. Um, And I would ask at the college, and this is what you need to do, is you got to get on the phone with these people. Um, By the time we got to our second daughter, (laughs) because our first daughter had had such um, an experience at Biola where, you know, her faith was shaky. Even though she grew up in our home and had a very strong faith going into it, you know, her faith had become very shaky. Now she's doing great now. She's thriving. Everything's good. But I wasn't going to send our younger daughter there and pay all that money. So what my husband and I did is we started pounding the phone. We had to get on the phone and this took a lot of time. And so you're not going to accomplish this simply by looking at the website, but you got to get on the phone and you got to talk to these people and you got to get past the 25-year-old admissions counselor who's working as the official spokesperson, marketing person for the school. You got to get past that person. So you might be able to ask some preliminary questions of that admissions counselor, but you've got to like go up the chain a little bit to get the more specific answers. And so what my husband and I did is we just started calling schools And we put together a list for our second daughter to go through. And we said, 
these are the schools that we feel comfortable with after talking to them. And you can, if you want our money, here's the schools that you can choose from. Now, if you want to pay your own way, you're an adult, that's fine. You want to go to these other schools, that's your decision. But if you want our money, these are the schools that we are willing to pay for. And so then she went through those schools and made a decision of where she would go. But you have to interview these schools almost like a job interview. Like, it's like here's some sample. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's some sample questions you could ask is, do staff and faculty need to have a Christian testimony? Is that documented anywhere? Are they interviewed for their Christian testimony? Do students need to have a Christian testimony? The overwhelming majority of Christian colleges do not require that their students are Christians. They only require that their faculty and staff are Christians and have a Christian testimony. So if the school is thinking about it that way, then even if you're paying a lot of money to send your kid to a Christian college, in their dorms, they're living with a lot of people who do not share your worldview. A few more things to look at after you read the doctrinal statement mm -hmm. is investigate the school's commitment to diversity. Because remember, our operational assumption is that there are some staff who already work there who are sympathetic to the critical social theories. So then I start doing a deep dive on websites, YouTube channels, social media posts, what, what is their stand on diversity? What are they saying? What kind of language are they using? Another thing you can, can look for, and Google is super helpful for, for all of those efforts. So you, then you can ask when you get on the phone with these people and say, hey, is there anybody there that I can talk to who heads up your school's diversity efforts? Does your school have a full-time diversity officer? How many people are there on staff who are paid to make sure the university is meeting its diversity goals? Is there a strategic plan in place related to diversity? How is the school implementing diversity across all of its curriculum? If you ask these kinds of specific questions, you will find out a lot about the school's vision, definition for diversity. And then you can weigh out, is this for me? Is this what I want to pay my hard-earned dollars for? But again, you have to ask for specifics. Then you can also look on social media, look on the school's official social media, but also look at potential professors' social media. Hmm. So think about, go on their website, see who the professors are in the department where your, your child might be going and then go find them on social media, find them on Twitter, find them on Instagram, see what they're retweeting, see what they're posting. Go back, scroll back in their timeline to May, June, and July of 2020. See what they posted. That will give you a lot of insight into where the school and their professors really are. Um, so you can ask for example, when you're on the phone with them, some other questions you can ask is, who are the influential professors on campus? That might give you some, some names of people to look up on social media. Now, I'm not saying dox these people. I'm not saying yeah. go to their house yeah. or stalk them or do anything nefarious. Just, Just doing your research. <laughs> yeah, it's in the public domain. Yeah. Just because whenever I mention this, people are like, you're telling people to dox professors? No, I'm not. I'm just saying, look, you know, just go look. Mm -hmm. Which professor would you say is most well-known at your school for the integration work that they have done between their academic field and the Christian faith? See what they say. Then look up that person on social media. See about their posts. See their posts from 2020. Um, ask about the professor's curricula vitae. That's usually a public document of what papers they've published, what books they've written. So if, you're, if your kid wants to go into social work, I would ask to talk to the department chair of the social work program. Ask them some questions. See if you can get some of the CVs 
of the professors that your kid would be taking, okay? So those are just some very practical things to do and as you're vetting. Because here's the thing is I always want to be super careful about recommending certain schools or not recommending other schools because my operational assumption, again, is that they're all on a spectrum. There's none that are totally pure <laughs> um, in almost no cases. I think there's a handful of exceptions at the seminary level, but but there's almost none that are just totally pure. So if you want something that's completely pure, that's that's going to be a, a, that's going to be a little bit like looking for a unicorn. Okay. So it's, it's going to be difficult. Um, and, and this is coming so from a woman who has degrees, but also is getting a PhD. You know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah. And I'm, I'm getting my, I'm not against so. education, yeah, you no, know, and I, I'm, I want to be clear. I'm only getting a doctor of ministry, but um, it's, I, I, I value education. I've worked in Christian higher ed, um, I think Christian education is important. Like I said at the beginning, we save for it from mm -hmm. the day our kids were born. I believe in Christian education. I am not here to tank all Christian education. In yeah. fact, this is my love letter yeah. to Christian higher ed to beg with them and plead with them mm. to please keep the faith mm. and to have some moral courage. Yeah. And so that that's what this is about for me. This is a love letter to people who work in Christian higher ed. Please have courage. Please stand up for the faith. Please do not cave to the critical social theories in the name of being academically respected. Um, that's not what we want to do. So, but if our operating assumption is that these schools are on a spectrum, mm -hmm. I might be okay with a school that's a three, but I'm like, I'm not sending my kid to a, to a school that's an eight or a nine. Mm. Okay. And so when my husband and I were kind of vetting schools. We were looking for schools that did not have a designated diversity office. We were looking for schools that did not have a diversity officer or multiple staff people. So up until very recently, 10 days ago, Biola had a designated diversity and equity office. Oh, I've heard of this. Yeah. And they, as of a year ago, they had like five or six full-time people in that office. Hmm. As of July 1st, they have dissolved that entire office hmm. and restructured some things. Hmm. And they no longer have a chief diversity officer. So I want to, that for me is possibly a good sign. I have some questions about it. People can go on my channel and watch my live stream where I talk in depth about that. Hmm. But as a back of the envelope calculation of what to look for in a school, yeah. I would say you want to look for a school where there is not a designated diversity office and there's no designated diversity officer. You want to look at how pervasive these ideas are. If you get on the phone and they're excited to tell you, oh, yes, we're we're embedding the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion across our whole school, and we have mandatory trainings for our faculty, and we're super excited about it. We have a lot of energy about it. I'm going to say that school is about an, an eight, a nine, or a 10. That's a hard no. I don't want to spend my money there. Yep. So that's one that I'm crossing off. Mm -hmm. If I get on the phone and I say, well, okay, they kind of are giving some lip service to diversity, but they're not actually paying anybody to do this. And, you know, it's more for public appearances or whatever I discern that it is. Maybe it's a three or a four. Um, but it's also dependent so much on the discipline. So like if you're going into engineering or yeah. chemistry. That's true. Or physics, mm. this these ideologies are not going to be as embedded in those things. Kinesiology. That's a good point. So it depends on what your kid is interested in, too. Yeah. So, um, so you have to factor that into it. If they're going into social work, and you send them to a school that has 
um, six full-time people in working in the diversity office. Let me tell you, that kid's going to get recatechized into the critical social theories Mm -hmm. at at their school. They're going to be learning socialism Mm -hmm. and they're going to be learning socialism in the name of Jesus. Okay. So that is how that is likely to work out. So this is why you've got to get on the phone. You got to talk to some people. You can't go by the website. You got to talk to the department chair. You got to interview these people like it's a job interview. That's a very good point about the discipline as well. And I'm glad that you mentioned in the beginning of the video where it would, it's most likely where DEI and you know, critical race uh, or critical theory in general, not just critical race theory, uh, will be taught uh, to yeah. them. Now, what if, let me ask you this. Let's say that you're a parent watching this and you feel terrible because you didn't do this homework. You didn't know. Yeah. You didn't know. You're, like, you're, you're just wanting to get your kid right. educated. I mean, when I, right. I swear it was like before 2016, life was just, and 2020, it was so different. I have two degrees from a secular college and I didn't hear any of this stuff. None of it. Yeah. It was so much fun getting my degrees. Um, maybe a little bit, I, even looking back at it, I, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to find a class that I took that wasn't rich with conversation and different viewpoints. And now, well, what major was, was your major? What was well, your major? My first degree was liberal arts. I accidentally okay. got that because I, I found now that I'm getting older, I found that I just love learning and okay. I just took random classes, random electives. And it ended up turning into my advisor saying, oh, you're two classes away from getting this degree. You might as well do this. And it ended up turning out really well because that liberal arts degree uh, was the foundation for me going and getting a bachelor's and a master's. And I needed these core classes to go and do other things. It was really interesting. Um, and then I have a degree in early childhood multicultural education. Okay. Okay. And I'm in a very liberal state. I'm in a state that, you know, is, is what is like a second California with some of this stuff. Um, very, yeah. very progressive. But when I went to college, this stuff was, it was fun. (laughs) I I remember just learning so much at a philosophy professor who was a Christian, but you didn't know that till the end of the class. Like he was really trying to teach us critical thinking and it was just really interesting. And so um, anyway, my point is, is that uh, during that, this time where all this is, is coming up, you have parents that might have some regrets that maybe sure. their, their kids are done um, with college and they're out and maybe they've really been affected by this. What can you say to them and give them some hope and encouragement in this regard? It's tough. Mm. I, I get those letters mm. and that struggle is real. That's not just a hypothetical. Mm. Um, they're, they're sad letters th- that from parents who homeschooled their kids sent them to a Christian college, prominent Christian colleges, and now they've deconstructed Yep. or they've canceled their parents, mm-hmm. you know? And um, I think that that guilt and those feelings of regret um, are probably more pervasive than many churches want to talk about. And are willing to have, you know, conversations about. And that regret is real. And I guess the best I can say to that is that as a parent with grown kids, I also have regrets. Mm. I also, I have many regrets. There are things that when I was in my 30s, you know, I, I thought I was doing a great job at and I thought I was you know, teaching my kids all about theology and apologetics before that was the in thing to do, you know, mm. and there, there was, I, I felt very alone. I felt very on an Island all by myself doing all this weird stuff. And even then my kids have had to walk their own roads and I've watched them ha- each have their own struggles. And so even if you had done everything, and you, that I'm talking about in this interview today, and even if you had vetted schools, even if you had been more careful, I'm here to tell you that your child still has to make their own decisions 
and that they are learning how to participate with the Lord and the Lord, the best thing you can do is pray for them. If you can, as much as you can preserve the relationship with them, but live your faith out authentically before them, because that is a story that isn't done yet. In, in most cases, that story is still being written. Hmm. And so, you know, keep walking forward and I know that the regret can sometimes feel crippling. It Parenting regret, I don't think people completely understand in their 30s and 40s. But when you get to be my age <laughs> and your kids are, are grown and kind of doing their own thing, and you look back, it's, it's very difficult. And you you realize, oh, I didn't show up for that very well. And I could have done better. So parenting regret is real. Your issue may be this college issue. Other people have different issues. Hmm. Don't think that I don't have issues. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Same. Um, you know, I'm just here to try to talk about this one specific thing. If this applies to you, great. And if it's a source of pain and struggle, my hope is that you'll still listen to this so you can help other people in your friend group, but also understand that God's forgiveness is big enough for you and for me and all of my regrets. And for me, that's a daily walk. So, no, that's so good. Um, I'm actually speaking at a parents' conference next week. And Everything you just said, I think I might repeat to them because that, <laughs> um, that's what I'm ending with is like, okay, man, what if you do all this perfectly? What if you do it all perfectly and say you have no regrets, but they still go their own way or they, they, they turn and I don't know, like they, they have this uh, rejection of everything. Yeah. You know, there's a sense of not owning it, right? Or you did the best that you could do, but the hope and the encouragement is what I want to give to them. And also God's providence. Yeah. It's very important too. It's different than God's sovereignty, which are both beautiful, but God's providence in particular is, is a very helpful to, to meditate on in this regard where he can use what we've done, mistakes that we've made, mistakes that they've made and, and use it for something greater later. Yeah. And I really like what you said that the story, it's not over yet. It's not over. Um, yeah. yeah. As long as people are still alive, mm -hmm. it's it's not over. Yeah. And let me answer your question before we wrap up here about good seminaries, because we haven't really talked about that. Okay, and, sure. And yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Seminaries are very important because yeah. those are the, the institutions that are training our pastors and future leaders. And I'm just going to name two because these are the two that I have had the most interaction with, and I feel very comfortable in bringing them up. And um, that's not to say that there isn't somewhere out there in the ether another school that is slugging it out in a biblically faithful way. It's They're just, everywhere. They're there. <laughs> I have not interacted with them yeah. at the level that I've interacted with people in leadership at these two schools. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to mention something out loud, I want to make sure that you know there, I have good reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Definitely our friends at Southern Evangelical oh, Seminary at SES. Yeah. <laughs> very faithful. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. always our go to. It's the one seminary that I always recommend to people. Yeah. Um, Super solid. And very solid. They teach inerrancy. They teach, you know, they will teach you how to think. And uh, from a natural law perspective, it is integrated throughout their school. It's a distinctive of their school. And I can recommend them without hesitation in what they are up to. And so definitely SES is always my go-to for people. Now, another school, and, and this is where I'm at, and because I've had a lot of interaction with the president and I really like what he's doing, it's a smaller school, lesser accreditation. You know, this is probably not the school to go to if, if accreditation is really big for you. Um, but still solid and, uh, is Birmingham Theological Seminary. Mm. 
they're affiliated with the Presbyterian Church in America. And so if you want more of a Reformed Presbyterian perspective, it's a solid school. The president, Ike Reeder, has big dreams. I love what he's doing. If I wasn't working at CFBU, I'd probably be asking Ike for a job. <laughs> That's how much I believe in what, what they're doing over there. Cool. And I, the, the doctor of ministry program that I am in is very much like a public theology degree and really lear- learning how to do theology in public spaces. So those are the two seminaries I'm going to mention What I love about BTS is if you're just looking for education and you want a very low cost alternative, they are so generous with their donors are so generous. The tuition is just crazy cheap Mm. and you're getting professors from really great institutions that moonlight over at BTS. And so I'm going to give my plug for those two seminaries. If you're a church and you're wanting to send and sponsor somebody from your church to go to a seminary mm. for future leadership and come back to you with that. Those are the two schools that I would, I would co-sign on. Very, so yeah, that's, I did, I did not tell Krista to mention SES just so you guys <laughs> know. Um, but I am not surprised that you mentioned them as being one of your top two picks. I, I was yeah. going to mention at the end of this video. Uh, yeah. SES does, they don't mess around. They are very yeah. solid. They don't play around with this kind of stuff. I have been very blessed by Southern Evangelical Seminary. I'll have a link in the description for both of these seminaries. And guys, I also want you to know, uh, if you're listening and you feel maybe there's discouragement, I want you to to pray about that. But I also want to encourage you because uh, if, if there's one thing I've learned this year, especially I went to go talk to a group of students in Sedona, Arizona, um, there was just something about this trip that really blessed me. But those group of kids, boy, they gave me so much hope and encouragement and a, and a look into what God is really doing. Okay. God, the Holy Spirit isn't, God isn't dead. All right. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's out, there's so many, there's good Christians, uh, solid seminaries, uh, really solid pastors, and they all love the Lord and they are out there. The Holy Spirit is alive and well. He's not yep. going anywhere. Um, and I want to give you all hope in this regard that yeah. for every, uh, it's like an ant. Okay. For like for every ant you see, there's like a hundred you don't. Yep. I think of that in a very optimistic way for every seminary you see that maybe has gone, gone astray. There's 10 others out there that might be small, that might not be well known, but they're staying true. They're staying solid. And I choose to kind of look at it like that, including mm-hmm. pastors in smaller church churches that maybe they don't have a platform. They're there and they are preaching the word of God all around the world. Um, so I kind of want to encourage everybody in that way to, to, to not just, we're, we're giving you tools, but I also want to encourage you as well yeah. in, in that. So Krista, is there anything that you want to add to, to anything that we talked about? Maybe something we missed before we sign off? Yeah, I want to also bring up the issue that I get a lot of questions about is, well, do we even really need to have a college education Oh, good question. (laughs) And I think that's a really fair question. I I would like to encourage parents, and I never thought I would say this because I am such a believer in Christian higher ed, but, um, you know, in this day and age, a, a Christian education is not necessarily as needed as it once was Mm. in order for a child to have success. Don't underestimate the, in high school, exploring with your kids, other opportunities, Mm. exploring with them entrepreneurship, really encouraging them to think about what talents and gifts God has given them that they could potentially turn into a business. Mm. And that that is a way of a a, a legitimate alternative path to developing the person that God has created them to be. Also consider trade schools or a trade. We need more competent people working in the trades, Mm -hmm. electricians, plumbers, carpenters, mason people, um, welders. And these can not only just be very practical and good paying jobs, but also beautiful expressions 
of the image of God. I am a person who has a very robust theology of work. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to condition our children to think that the only real jobs are those that you get as a result of going to college. There is dignity in all honest work. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying fraud is dignity or crime is dignity, but all honest work, whether you are a butcher, baker, or bagger at Trader Joe's, all of that work <laughs> has dignity yeah. and it is a way of loving your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so don't disciple your children so much into the idea that they must go to college if they really want to support themselves. Mm -hmm. There are other opportunities available. Now, if your child truly wants to go into a specific field like medicine. And medicine is another field that has been deeply impacted and is being completely overhauled and reshaped mm -hmm. by the critical social theories. Nursing, doctors, all of that. Nutritionists, fat theory has taken over nutrition. Um, I think like social workers, sociology, therapy, psychologists, literature and English, these are areas that if your child wants to go into one of these areas, you're going to have to do some things as a parent to prepare them for confronting the critical social theories, whether they go to a Christian college or to a secular college. Mm -hmm. The damaging thing is when you haven't prepared your child for the Christian college, because there is a sense in which the Christian college is more dangerous for that child. Because they are the college, is, the professors are hooking discipleship to the critical social theories. Hmm. And that is confusing for the child. So if you haven't given them a heads up about that, that's when those are the kids that get can get really swallowed up by it. Whereas if they go to a secular college and you've already warned them, hey, you're going to learn a bunch of worldly things, ignore most of it, get your degree, keep your head down. Just do your thing. Avoid, avoid, You're like, avoid. Okay, I can just hit the delete button here. Yeah. I don't have to listen to this. Yeah. I don't have to think about it. <laughs> but when, you're, when your professor is telling you this is how you love your neighbor, mm -hmm. and then they're marrying it to Marxist feminist theory, mm -hmm. that's when it becomes very confusing. Yeah. So, you know, there are professions where we have to have a college education. You can't become a teacher or a lawyer without a college education, mm -hmm. but not everybody has to be on that path. Yeah. And so, you know, try to help your kid explore what's out there for them, even if it's through a gap year program or letting them take their time. And I have our, um, our old, our younger daughter, like take the strengths finder test and, you know, take some, do some things to help explore who God has made you to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is this is good. I really thoroughly enjoyed this this conversation and this topic. It's so interesting. Um, so I, I just want to thank you, Krista, for coming on. This is the first time you've come on my channel. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description to everything that's relevant to this conversation, including where you can find Krista, her website, YouTube channel, all the things. Uh, and so also uh, the the seminaries in, in, in question, they'll be there as well. Uh, Krista, thank you so much for coming on today and talking with me about this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for uh, the, the discussion and helping me get, get the word out about these important conversations. Yeah.